Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute. Uh, it, it, it really is my great pleasure today to welcome Tom Koken. Uh, Tom is the George Maverick Bunker Professor of Management uh, and Professor of Work and Employment Research and co-director of the MIT Sloan Institute for Work and Employment Research, IWER, uh, at, at MIT. I know many of you, probably all of you, are familiar with Tom's uh, work, the incredible body of work that he's put together. And for those of you who aren't that familiar with the formal academic work, I'm sure everybody's familiar also with the, the public work that you've been doing on NPR and um, other outlets that I, I've greatly appreciated. Um, as you know, Tom is the author of Restoring the American Dream, A Working Family's Agenda for America, and also Shaping the Future of Work, which will really be the topic for today. Um, I hope, Tom, you don't mind if I characterize your work a little bit, at least as I've learned from it over the years. Uh, I think it's certainly fair to say that Tom's work underscores the idea that work, that employment is an important, the most important manifestation of the social contract. That if you think about the social contract, there's of course hierarchy in any society, there's power in government, there's power among employers. They're the employed who may not have a whole lot of power always, but can make decisions and don't always have to be compliant. And I think what Tom's work shows is that when things really work well, all the different members of the social contract work in such a fashion that employment creates value for people, sustainable income, it creates dignity, it creates fairness, and for that to happen, all the pieces need to come together, the policy piece on government, the managerial practices on the part of employers, voice on the part of employees, creativity on the part of employees. And as, Tom works, as Tom's work shows, that kind of outcome is possible. There's, there are historical examples in this country and elsewhere of that kind of outcome. And in fact, uh, today there are specific company examples of really outstanding behavior, outstanding outcome by all members of the social contract. But as Tom's work also shows, there are real problems. And there are moments, and maybe arguably the current moment, in which the social contract has gone badly awry. What Tom will talk about today, among other things, is the manner by which, the nature by which, the social contract seems to have gone awry with regard to employment, and maybe even more important, some paths out and toward paths toward a much better outcome. After Tom speaks, we're going to have um, some discussion, some comments by Rick Locke. As you all know, Rick is the 13th provost of uh, Brown. And Rick, um, and for the, this discussion, more important point is Rick is a professor of political science here at Brown, professor of, of uh, international and public affairs. Um, Rick is, again, as you know, a specialist on comparative political economy and employment relations and international labor standards. Um, you are familiar with, and I hope you've heard Rick speak about, and I hope even more that you've read Rick's most recent book, The Promise and Limits of Private Power, Promoting Labor Standards in a Global Economy. Tom, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Ed. Well, thank you, Ed, for that introduction and for the invitation to come down to see so many good friends, old friends, members of the community, members of our community, you know, uh, a number of people here, including Rick and Ed and others here have been with us at MIT, and we have kind of a, a, a concept that once you're part of the MIT community, at least in our little corner of the world, you're always a, a member of our community. So I feel right at home here uh, talking about these issues and discussing them with people who share concern about where we are, not only in the, the world of work, but the world of work is embedded in an economy. The world of work is embedded in a society that is deeply troubled at the moment. And so we can't divorce ourselves from that context. And I believe that what we do need, as the title suggests, is to somehow stay positive and to have a positive narrative about the future, rather than reacting to every particular development, uh, pleasant or unpleasant of the moment, we need to demonstrate that we have a, an alternative view, one that can be captured in a way that resonates with the American public so that we can find a way forward through the chaos of the moment 
and make sure that we can build an economy that works for all and build a society that works uh, for everyone uh, moving forward. That's what I'd like to talk about today. That's why I call it staying the course. We've been on this journey for a long time. Uh, we have a long way to go, but I do believe there are paths forward. And I'd like to engage in a discussion with this, and I'm happy uh, uh, to uh, entertain comments or questions as, as we go along. It's lunchtime. Uh, it's a good time to uh, have a conversation, uh, and uh, I would invite that if you're uh, so inclined. So let me uh, ask, what's at stake here? Well, first of all, I do believe, as I've just said, that we are in a period of time when we haven't seen a challenge to our basic democratic values any time since we've uh, started to, to work in this field, since we've uh, started to think about these issues. And so we have to think about how we address these from the standpoint of deep values in our society, values that we cherish as people, as individuals, and as professionals who study and work in the world of, of work and employment uh, and in the larger political economy. But I think for me it's a, maybe even a little more personal that I am at the stage in life that I worry about the legacy that we are leaving to our next generation or two generations uh, removed. And I do think that uh, unless we take action now and unless we build a cross-generational coalition with young people today, we are not going to be able to sustain the kind of changes that are needed to move us forward. So I take this as a very personal challenge and a personal responsibility for many of us of a similar age or generation in this room to make sure that we are talking to people across generations. We are listening to what young people are asking for in their world of work today and tomorrow, and we help them to realize their dreams as we were fortunate enough uh, to do so during our uh, working time. And we obviously have to do this with an eye on the current context. This little uh, 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 graph uh, comes from a session that I held uh, or was, was part of with a group of CEOs in Europe. And they wanted to talk about the pressures. And we used this metaphor of a tinderbox, as you know, a tinderbox is something that could explode at any moment. And they were so taken up with uh, the discussion of these issues that over the course of the day, we almost never got off this particular uh, uh, slide. They wanted to talk about what do we need to do to deal with the populism that's growing across Europe? What do we need to do? They don't call it the end of the American dream. They call it the social lift in France and in other countries. But they have the same worries about the next generation and all the tensions, the income inequality, the backlash against trade, the Brexit uh, experience and, and what's happening. Um, with the social tensions uh, of immigrants across Europe. All of these interact with concerns about the future of work and the role of technology and whether it's going to uh, eliminate more jobs than it creates, to create a, a, a confluence of pressures that simply require much more proactive leadership on the part not only of business leaders, but the conclusion of that day is one that, is, that resonates very well with what I'm going to say here uh, uh, as we go forward, that we have to bring all of the stakeholders together, that this set of tensions and the challenges we face today can't be addressed just by one group, by business leaders thinking they can fix it. They have to become part of a broader democratic fabric and, and break down some of the barriers that have caused us to act in our own silos. So I think this is the context, and this is what people not only in Europe, but the American public is looking for. This is what the American public spoke to us uh, so forcefully in the last uh, election and even before that. And now it's time not only to listen to them, but to move forward. So uh, in a sporting context, sometimes it's uh, uh, the, 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 the term is the best defense is a good offense. And that's what I'd like us to, to pursue here. An alternative narrative that looks forward to how we can shape the future of work and build a social contract that heals the wounds in society, regardless of what any particular leader in Washington or elsewhere uh, pursues. We need to have an alternative view. What do I mean by a social contract? 
at work, and uh, I obviously borrow this from uh, uh, political philosophers, a number of them. Uh, uh, John Jacques Rousseau uh, is probably best known for using this term, but so are others, maybe a bit more traditional, a bit more conservative in our view uh, of the world today. But I borrow it to, to use this, this concept to talk about what do we expect out of work? What are the obligations that each of us as parties to an employment relationship uh, are expected to uphold and to achieve workers, employers, and our communities and our societies? I believe that we need to think about how to rebuild what is now broken as a social contract uh, or compact, if you don't quite like uh, to go to, the, to a, a stronger term. But I think this is uh, one way or a metaphor that I've used. Let me just give you two illustrations. We won't focus on uh, all of the problems because they're so well known and so uh, highly uh, already uh, discussed in, in the media, in our research, and in, in your own work, I'm sure. But we're now a decade after the beginning of what was called the Great Recession. And this chart, which is put together by the Brookings Institution, is the best uh, single graphic of how we are doing in getting the jobs back that we lost in the recession and enough to keep up with the growth in the labor force. Here we are in February 2017, and we still haven't closed that gap. If we continue to grow the jobs at about the rate that the health, healthy rate that we've had for the last two years, we're going to finally get there sometime mid-year, maybe June, maybe July, maybe maybe a little bit earlier or later if it slows down. Well, that's, a, that's really a lost decade, and a decade that's going to have fundamental long-term effects on young people in particular entering the labor force. And this uh, chart, while it's very, very good, does not capture the number of people, the older parts of our labor force, who have dropped out of employment altogether because they can't find work that replaces the jobs they lost, whether it's from automation, international trade, restructuring, or whatever. And so we have a large number of people who expressed their deep, deep concerns and anger over the last year because they're not even in these numbers at the moment. And I think this is the short term in terms of a decade challenge, but it's, it's only one of a larger challenge. This, I, I can't give a talk without this slide, and you probably all, many of you have seen this. This isn't original to me. Uh, it's, it's put together by, first by the Economic Policy Institute a number of years ago, and then a number of us have, have modified it and tweaked it a bit and, and, and changed it. But basically, it just shows that the problems that we're experiencing here, in fact, I would argue that one of the root causes of the anger and the frustration and the concerns that we have uh, in society today are captured here. Because we did, if going back to the early uh, parts of this, this diagram in the 1940s, from, it checks the growth of productivity, that uh, dark line uh, that continues to grow relative to the changes in, in average workers' compensation in society. And if you look from the 1940s, to about 1980, those two lines went in tandem. We had sort of an implicit social contract where as the economy got better, so too did uh, uh, wages and compensation for most workers. Now, not everyone was included in that uh, social contract. Women didn't do as well as men. Minorities certainly didn't do as well as uh, white working class and white uh, middle class and, and, and uh, executives did. So I don't want to overstate the notion there were the good old days, but we did have an economy where there was a growing middle class, and then something happened in 1980. And we can debate what that was, but it was a confluence of factors, not only a shift from a, a, a Democratic to a Republican president with Ronald Reagan's election, but a deep recession to break the back of inflation, the rise of the, the dollar relative to the Japanese yen, the growth of of imports, the beginning of the knowledge economy, all of that took place in the 1980s. And we're still, still dealing with some of these same pressures unsuccessfully. That's why we see wages flatlining since then. That's why we see um, so many people feeling that they have been left behind in this economy. And so our challenge is to start to, f to find ways to bring those two lines together again. 
to find ways to get wages moving, to get the, the quality of work moving, to get the quality of jobs that we can sustain in this economy moving forward uh, in the future. So that's really the, the territory. That, that captures in, in some ways some of the, the things that, uh, that uh, bring us here today. So I want to talk about three building blocks to what I think uh, could help us move toward a better social contract for the, for the next generation of people in our labor force. I'm going to talk about three things, about a high road, uh, employment and uh, economic strategy. I'm going to talk about rebuilding worker bargaining power, because I believe you can't get there unless we do something to rebuild worker bargaining power in modern ways that reflect the economy of today and the, the workforce of today. And then I want to talk uh, just briefly about the need to bring these various stakeholders together. And I include not just traditional business and labor, but when I use the word labor, I want to talk about the broad range of workers in all the diversity we have in the workforce, and also the new institutions that are coming along to try to bring voice to workers, as well as the more traditional labor movement. Uh, and I also include education, our role, given the importance of skills and knowledge and and education in our society, I think we have to take a much more active role in helping to bring these stakeholders together along with government. So that's the train I'm going to cover. What do I mean by high road and low road? This is a simple graphic that tries to capture the very fundamental notion that we stress in our teaching and that comes from a lot of research uh, at MIT and universities around, around the country. Uh, over the last uh, uh, really 30 years. I, there's a slide here that's going to say 20 years. I think time flies when you get uh, maybe to my age, so I really should have said 30 years. But we have understood for a long time now that business leaders have choices in how they compete. And those choices have predictable consequences. There's the, the traditional notion that you can, you can treat workers as costs to be controlled, minimize those factor costs, Keep, keep workers from having much discretion, keep unions out of the, the workplace at all costs or in whatever way one can, and one can be successful in making money that way in many industries and in many settings. Not in all, but in the dominant uh, uh, parts of our economy. And I suppose the, the, the classic case is Walmart. We always use Walmart because it's such a visible and such a, 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 a clear prototype where Low prices all the time translate into low wages, high turnover, not investing in the workforce, and competing and being successful, growing to become the largest employer in the United States uh, and one of the largest private employers, if not the largest one, outside of uh, military uh, forces uh, around the world. And there's an alternative strategy that says let's view workers as assets, let's invest in them, Let's make sure that, that uh, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, specifically about what's involved, but basically making sure that we achieve high levels of productivity so that we can su support and sustain good jobs, good wages, and uh, opportunities for workers over time. And that's, I believe, the big choice that we have. Now, the economy is changing. The structure of, of corporations are changing. There's all of the gig economy and contracting. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. So this isn't going to solve all of the problems, but it's a necessary feature to move forward. Because if we don't have business strategies driving our corporations that can sustain good jobs, then we're always going to be uh, uh, dealing with the lowest common denominator in our economy, uh, the low road employers. So uh, we need to, to move forward. And there are lots of examples. These are just the kind of household names and then a few at the bottom. I'm going to describe a little bit more. Southwest Airlines, uh, one of our former students, Jody Hoffer-Gattel, did her dissertation on Southwest, and, and it still carries forward today to be the uh, most profitable airline, the, one of the highest paying airlines, maybe a little bit too high. It's getting a little bit of competitive pressure, and, and so that's a, a challenge. One can't go too far down the, the, this road, but, it's, but it also has high levels of customer service and satisfaction and has been able to sustain a high road strategy. Relative to other airlines, uh, my wife said to me this morning when uh, we were 
uh, she was dropping me off at the train, and she said, you know, she had heard American Delta and, I don't know, maybe United, now have uh, uh, super low, kind of uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 the, the lowest fares where you can, you can get a seat, but you can't bring on a luggage. They won't even serve you water. Uh, but uh, you'll, you, you might get there without having to do a standing uh, room only uh, arrangement in airlines. Well, you know, that doesn't build uh, high levels of customer service. It certainly doesn't make the flight attendant's job any easier, less stressful, or any more pleasant. So there are two ways to compete in the airline industry, and we've done a lot of work on that. Costco is the competitor of, Air, of, of Walmart that outcompetes it in terms of stock prices and job quality and so on. Kaiser Permanente, we've studied in the healthcare industry. You can find organizations in every industry from healthcare to, to autos to steel to apparel and others. Uh, and, and, and you can find these high road form, firms and even some small ones. Some of you might have heard of this little uh, operations in New York City largely, but growing in, in other places as well, called Managed by Q. It's, it's, a, it's a janitorial service. It'll come in and clean uh, the buildings here in the Watson Institute. If you want, Ed, you can probably, I don't know if they're located in Providence yet, but you probably could find them. Uh, but they also then have expanded so they can provide career ladders for workers that they'll also fix your uh, furniture or they will do uh, small jobs to do repairs on other kinds of uh, things that need to be done, or they will uh, reinstall carpets, or they'll, they'll even work on your IT problems in the middle of the night, uh, if that's what you want, with jobs that are not just contract jobs, but career jobs. Organizations like that are coming along and competing with a lower road form of contractors. Ziggerman's is a, a little deli uh, a, a restaurant in the Chicago area, and they put on training for how you build, they don't call it high road, obviously, but, but how you build uh, provide good food, but also can uh, provide training for its employees. Ask Power is a, is a company in Chicago that I just learned about and met the CEO, where he took pride in bringing uh, one of his employees to an Aspen Institute uh, uh, session last, uh, uh, last month. And, and this Latina woman talked with enormous pride in Spanish, and the CEO translated, about how they brought automation to bear on their manufacturing operations uh, to, they, they supply the utility industry with various components. And, and he then described, you know, we couldn't make this automation work until we started to ask the workforce, how can we do it? And train them, and they made the transformation of this organization. It's that kind of, of culture, that's kind, kind of process that is so important. I won't go through this slide except to say it takes a, 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 what some people call a bundle, what we might call a system. It's a set of practices. It's a management pra set of management practices. It's a management mindset. It's a management philosophy. And it's a worker-empowered organization that starts by hiring people with both technical and communications and behavioral skills. Southwest Airlines screens pilots. Of course you want a pilot to know how to fly an airplane with competence, but you also want that pilot to help out the flight attendants and the service employees when there's, there's problems and to cross those lines and to solve problems together. Training and investment, building a positive culture, building a, a, a team uh, form of work organization. Where there's unions, it has to be a labor management partnership of some sort, not just the traditional adversarial processes. The research underlying this simple slide is what I meant by the, the 30 years of, of research. We know something about what it takes to build these kinds of organizations based on research that our students and others have done over many, many years. And so I think our job is to make sure that we understand uh, how to build them and we continue to move forward. But the problem is, while we can give isolated examples, and we can give uh, you quantitative evidence that uh, organizations that successfully implement some of these strategies or in their own particular context can be successful in producing highly productive organizations and sustain good jobs. They are, they are not the norm. They're still the exception because they're held down by the low road firms. And they're competing with those low road firms. And so we have to think about what are the obstacles that 
uh, uh, would need to be overcome to go from the exception to the norm. Again, I, I don't want to dwell on all of these points, but let me start with the one at the top because we have a capitalist system in the United States that's a pretty unique capitalist system. Now, I'm not an opponent of capitalism in, in the broad sense, but we also have choices about the forms of capitalism that we have. And we have been captured since the 1980s by this short term, what some people call financialization. I can't spell it. Spell check doesn't like it. It's a terrible <laughs> word, but it, it, it captures the notion that the firm has been captured by the uh, Wall Street finance oriented executives within the firm and their agents that they deal with and having to report quarterly earnings and, and, and meet those targets on the short term. Well, there, we can look to the long term. We can, we can demonstrate that those firms that uh, take a longer term perspective and embed uh, the kind of practices earlier uh, uh, on the earlier slide will compete, sometimes outcompete, sometimes compete equally, sometimes maybe it's, a, it's not such a, a positive horse race, but they can be successful. And so we need to start to tackle this really fundamental issue about what do we expect from firms. And we need to rebalance the role of Wall Street and start to emphasize more of some of the new forms of, of financing that are coming along. A lot of uh, social impact firms, uh, our, our social impact investors, are now growing up to about $8 trillion a year. Now, that's a, still a small subset of the, 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 the total. But these, these firms that are looking for ways to figure out how to invest in, in the longer term, higher road firms are out there. And we need to support them with our dollars and with, uh, uh, with evidence to help them move forward. We need to also deal, and I'll talk about uh, this in a moment, uh, with the, f the, the very weak labor and employment policies. The fact that there's not much pressure either from government, in fact, there are some po potential negative uh, uh, actions that government uh, could take that will reduce the emphasis on uh, high road firms, and the fact that there's the decline of the labor movement that has weakened workers and worker voice and worker power so that there's not pressure from below to move forward. That pressure from below in the 1940s through the 1970s came from collective bargaining. The Treaty of Detroit, which was, is, is uh, uh, coined by uh, Nelson Lichtenstein, a, a great labor historian, where GM and the UAW reached an agreement in the 40s, late 1940s, to increase wages by productivity and cost of living and use that formula and then the spread of collective bargaining and pattern bargaining and lots more detail that, that we could go into have helped to, to move that bargain and those norms across the economy because labor had enough power to do so. Now, that was a different era. It's not coming back in the same exact form or mirror image. We've got to think about what the functional equivalent of that process would be for moving forward. And then we have some other things that uh, our colleagues, as, 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 as my friends here know, in system dynamics have a, have a term that's called worse before better. And that is, it takes a while. If, if Let's take Walmart. Walmart's made all the noises that they want to move. They want to, they've raised wages. They've raised wages probably because they've had some pressure from minimum wage increases and from the fight for 15 and others and because the labor market's getting a little tighter. But they have raised wages, and they are beginning to invest in training. But are they willing to do the full range of things and stay with it long enough to turn this giant organization into a high road firm? Well, the verdict uh, is still out, and we should watch what they do and give them credit for taking these first steps. But I can guarantee you, and Wall Street has already penalized Walmart for doing so, that their stock price, their, co their costs are going to go up because they've got to make some of these longer term investments. They've got to change the structure. They've got to improve operations, as our colleague Zenith Tan has, 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 has written and spoken so eloquently about, about the operations side of, of, of a high road strategy. All of that takes investment, time, energy, and management commitment for a period of time. And as the early champions, walk away from Walmart from retirement, get fired, or go on to something else, 
the, the new kind of bean counters come in and say, why are, we, why are our costs out of line? Wall Street says, why are your costs out of line? You keep telling me it'll get better, but when will it get better? And that's when firms walk away from a lot of these things. So this is not easy. There's a lot of things that firms need to do, a lot of things we need to do as business schools, as professional programs in, 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 in university programs across our campuses need to start to think about what do we teach? Are we teaching uh, that there are choices in this area or are we uh, part of the problem? Well, I would uh, assert that historically we are more part of the problem than part of the solution, or at least the dominant uh, uh, groups within business schools in particular, finance and neoclassical economics, don't teach this. They're beginning to, and we now have courses on social impact investing, led by one of our finance, young finance faculty members at, at MIT. We're a little bit behind other business schools, I think, that are ahead of us on this. So we've got a lot to do, and there are other things that we could talk about here. How do we move forward? Well, I do believe we've got to attack those root causes, but we also have to get more vocal. That's why Ed said that I spend a little bit more time these days than, than maybe in earlier parts of uh, my career on uh, social media or uh, various kinds of uh, uh, programs to speak out on these issues. I think we have to become part of this discourse in a much more vocal way, and we have to speak to the American public, not just to ourselves in our, our, our articles and peer-reviewed journals. We should continue to do that but we've got to make sure we bring this message uh, across. And so we're doing this more. I teach an online class. I'll give a little pitch for that uh, at the end to try to reach larger uh, segments of the, the public on these issues. And we need to, to uh, continue to expand our reach and our uh, uh, research uh, so that uh, we can begin to bring uh, these ideas to a larger number of people. I mentioned already to encourage the, the social investing that we see growing in small numbers, but growing. We just had a, a class last night with a fantastically active fellow, an energetic fellow who's, talk, who's starting his own firm after being part of Lehman Brothers that went down and then being part of Bank of America and then, and then a couple of other uh, uh, organizations. He's now doing his own social investing because he's sick of just taking the multi-million dollars who can afford to invest in, in these kinds of funds and reach us, uh, uh, the average investors out there. So I think there's more of this, and I think we can encourage it um, as we move forward. And yes, as I said, we need to take the second leg of this stool and rebuild worker bargaining power. Now, when I say that, maybe not in this audience, it may not be as controversial. But I can tell you from uh, lots of uh, things thrown at me from various places that this is not the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of folks in the United States. And in fact, most people say the labor movement's dead, and maybe that's okay. It served a purpose, maybe, in the past, but we're beyond that. We don't need it anymore, and it's not coming back. So now the private sector has about 6% of 6.4% of the workforce covered under collective bargaining agreements. That's not enough to have a, a substantial impact as a social engine, an economic engine for change and for innovation. And my fear is my friends in the labor movement are going to, are going to kind of get their backs up against the wall now in the current environment and become more defensive and unable to innovate uh, uh, in response to the kind of attacks that I expect to see coming forward. That will not serve us well. And we need to have a forward-looking, a powerful but innovative set of, call it a labor movement, call them unions, call them, come up with a better name if there's a better name, but we need a collective voice where workers in a democratic society can decide what form, if any, collective voice they want and find ways to pursue it in ways that not only speak to their interests, but speak to the kind of organizations that they want to be part of and the kind of uh, problems that they want to address. That's what young people are telling us in survey after survey. That's what they tell us in the online course when we do a, a, a survey of what are their uh, key aspirations at work. They want to be part of something that they can identify with in a positive way. And so we need to find the institutional forms of worker voice 
that will give them power to be sure, but also in ways that are sustainable with their interests and with the economy that we're involved in today. So how do we do that? Well, we do have some things to learn from the past. We shouldn't throw out everything we've learned about collective bargaining. We know that labor and management working together, when labor is powerful enough to get a labor management partnership, can drive productivity, can sustain productivity. The Kaiser per, uh, Permanente Labor Management Partnership that we worked with started in 1997, and it continues today. It's the longest standing. It's not without its warts and its, its difficulties, but it has helped Kaiser Permanente move from almost being broken up because they were losing so much money in the 1990s to the model for health care as an integrated health care provider and insurance organization uh, for others around the country, an advanced, uh, a leader in the use of advanced uh, electronic medical records, uh, highest uh, uh, paying uh, uh, and best uh, fringe benefits of, of any health care organization in the country, and a financial uh, success with improving health care quality. We know that this can work but we've got to figure out how to make uh, more organizations work together in this kind of way. We know education and training is important. The highest rate of return of any training program in the United States are union apprenticeships. And what has been happening to union apprenticeships in the last 20 years? They've been going down as the labor movement goes down. A lower proportion of, of our workforce now is engaged in apprenticeships than was the case in the 1970s and even the 1990s. And so we've got to rebuild them, but rebuild them in a modern way and open up apprenticeships to the broad cross-section of our labor force, to community members, to more minorities, to more women, to people who uh, are starting out in their careers and provide them with the kind of ongoing training, apprenticeship, and various kinds of other uh, workforce investment over the full life of their careers. That's got to be part of what the next generation unions or whatever we call them do because it's the one thing that they do better than any other institution in our society. We need to build coalitions. There's lots of experimentation going on. The labor movement is finally opening up to community coalitions, to worker centers, to various religious groups, to immigrant groups which are, are, are becoming more and more active all the time. The, the fight for 15, the $15 minimum wage, is the best experiment that we have had uh, along these lines, and it is having an effect across the country. We now have 30 states that have increased their minimum wage, not just because of this, but they can feel the pressure, they can see the support that it generates politically from uh, uh, elections and polls and every other uh, 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 indicator, and so we're seeing some movement along those lines. This list in the middle of the, of the chart here, coworkers.com, fantastic organization that has now uh, really gotten a boost by uh, uh, all of the concern of the high tech firms around uh, immigrant rights and around the, the actions of the administration of the last uh, several uh, weeks. Well, why did those CEOs in some of the high tech firms like Facebook and Google take action? Because coworker.com is forming petitions among workers in those organizations, and they're building uh, modern forms of organization where the workers can, pro can work with them to uh, bring their voice to their CEOs, and that's part of what's happening inside those organizations. The Workers Lab is an incubator where they're trying to learn from business about how to start up new organizations that speak to workers' interests in new ways. Our, it used to be our Walmart, but it's, it's now independent but it's working to build community within Walmart using artificial intelligence tools for them to communicate and to, to ask um, this particular group if I feel I'm not getting my appropriate overtime or minimum wage or whatever, I can say, is anybody else having that problem? And then I can go and click on another button and say, what are my rights? And this AI system will provide them feedback and information and there are people behind the AI system, thank God, to actually provide uh, services as well. We're seeing a whole bunch of these grow. None of them are at scale. None of them have a sustainable business model, but they're all moving to try to bring about new forms of, of worker organization. 
And then my favorite question, and I put the question mark there as a real question. Today, so many young people, and maybe others, don't stay long enough, don't want to stay long enough in an organization to fight when they feel that they are being uh, treated unfairly. They'll, they'll go somewhere else. Well, there are a bunch of organizations that are trying to figure out how do we make exit and mobility as a new source of power to provide more information on where the good jobs are and the bad jobs are. Glassdoor is one example. I don't like Glassdoor, but that's all right. Uh, because it, it's, it's just, it, it, it's not very reliable, well, I don't think it's very reliable data, but it provides people information. We need to figure out how you mobilize with that information so that you can serve worker interest to really change employer behavior and provide an incentive. Lots of things are going on here, and the exciting thing is that we, 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 we can't even envision yet what young people will come up with, because these are all young entrepreneur, worker entrepreneurs developing these things. We need to encourage it and make, make it uh, uh, see if we can test ways to use exit as a source of power. And then we can't get there without a high road labor and employment policy. Now, I guess, you know, this, this, uh, we should just have a blank slate, uh, slide here and say maybe this is the best we can hope for. But we can't let the current situation and what might happen in Washington drive uh, our thinking. We need to have an alternative narrative about the future of labor policy, and these are just some of the elements that I will continue to speak for uh, as, as strongly as I can, and we ought to all speak out if we see policy moving in, in an alternative or a negative direction, but we should not just react. We should think about a positive narrative that will help us move forward. So how do you reward high road firms? How do you uh, uh, create an incentive for low road firms to come up. These are just some examples. The first test is going to come, and it's going to come soon, because the Obama administration, with the leadership of a good friend of ours, David Weil, at the Wage and Hour Division, have uh, implemented, I'm sorry, have not implemented, they have promulgated, if that's a word uh, that I can speak, uh, they, they, uh, a new set of overtime rules to raise the threshold on salary for overtime. That's way long overdue. Unfortunately, a judge in Texas has, has issued an injunction to stop implementation. One of the first things the Trump administration and, and the Trump Secretary of Labor will have to decide is do they fight that injunction as it, it's being fought at the moment, or do they let the injunction stand and let the overtime rules uh, go back to where they were? Now, the best employers are already changed. I suspect here uh, that uh, my good friend, the provost, has, has done some work to look at it. it. Uh, yeah, you're, you're in compliance. You've moved forward. You haven't waited for implementation. And so have many, many, many firms that I'm aware of and talked to, and most of these firms don't want to go back. So let's not let the lowest common denominator of American business lead uh, the pack on this issue, but let's move forward. That's just one example, but we can do a lot of other things. It's time to end being the last country in the world in, of a highly developed nation to not have a paid family and sick leave. If we now expect both parents to be in the labor force in order to make a decent standard of living, or we expect single parents because of our, our welfare reforms from the Clinton administration on to be working, then we have a responsibility to make sure that we can meet our dual uh, work and family needs and responsibilities with uh, some form of paid leave. We're seeing a lot of this at the local level. That's a great uh, step forward, but we need a national policy. On the labor policy, specifically on labor relations, where we're not going to see much uh, movement except perhaps in the wrong direction, in my view, but we have to, we have to make clear what would a forward-looking looking labor policy uh, look like. Well, it starts by fixing the basics, so workers really do have a choice, and I won't go through the evidence, but suffice it to say that the evidence is workers can't really get access to collective bargaining through the procedures under our National Labor Relations Act uh, in today's world. So we have to fix that, and that's only a starting point, not the end point. We need to promote forms of labor management, collaboration, that, that work effectively, and then we need to open it up to allow these new forms of uh, worker voice and experimentation with new approaches uh, uh, that are emerging to be protected and encouraged and to, uh, to show us 
what will work and to help us develop the next generation of worker voice in this country. And then finally, the government policy and all of us need to really bring these stakeholders together. And this is just a, a, a simple list of the, the stakeholders that I think need to be brought together. I would love to see the Secretary of Labor and others in the administration take their responsibilities for bringing the parties together, but we shouldn't wait for that to happen. We all have a responsibility to work with employers, the high road employers, to work with new entrepreneurs, the large number of people who want to build a more inclusive entrepreneurship culture and strategy to overcome the narrowness and the, the emphasis that, that venture capitalists have placed on, on funding men, not women, funding short-term uh, organizations that don't really make these investments. We can change entrepreneurship in ways that build right from the beginning good jobs into their business plans and strategies building coalitions with community groups and education groups that reach out to larger numbers through online and other kinds of mechanisms. These, this is the fabric of society. These are the stakeholders that need to come together to make this happen. It's our responsibility to work together. I think this is an, a, a great area where here at the Watson Institute and other parts of Brown University can work with a number of us who are trying to uh, bring uh, some of these uh, together. So it's time for us to lead. It's time for us to, to, to make sure that we are promoting the kinds of good jobs and good companies that uh, we need. We're doing this at MIT with a new initiative that we call Good Companies and Good Jobs. Uh, it's funded uh, with a, a very nice, uh, a generous gift from the Hitachi Foundation, and we're going to have a lot of activity going forward. I teach this online course to try to reach large numbers, and it's free and open to the public. And I would encourage all of you to sample it and to, to participate in it and bring your voices into the conversation about these kinds of issues. And more than anything else, let's go out and let's listen to people. The voices of those who have been left behind were finally heard in this election but they weren't heard by us or by our political uh, partners early enough, strong enough to really understand the pent-up anger of people who have lost their jobs and don't see hope in this society. We need to understand them. We need to understand young workers. We need to understand those people who have been left behind. We need to listen to them, and then we need to speak to them with a clear narrative and a convincing strategy for moving forward. So we're embarking as part of our initiative on, on just generating worker stories. We have our students going out, and they are loving it, to go out and talk to workers and then record it and do sort of their own version of a podcast. And it's such a powerful teaching technique because all of a sudden they hear and they see the power of the workforce and the frustrations and the hopes and the aspirations. If we listen to people, I think we can start to make, for, make progress. And then Finally, uh, I can't end this without repeating what I said earlier, that we shouldn't let the current administration or anyone else speak for us and just be on the defensive. Because if we learned anything from sports, that uh, the best defense is still a good offense. So you can take the kid out of Wisconsin, but you can't take uh, the, the loyalty of the Packers out of uh, it. And so, uh, actually, uh, I'll end here, uh, but, uh, you know, in the world of alternative facts, uh, you know, actually the Packers won the Super Bowl. In case you didn't know that, I have on uh, good authority that, that uh, you know, it's all fake news and that, uh, in my mind, <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. If, if we would have had a Packers Patriots Super Bowl, I'd have had a civil, civil war in my house with my, my kids. But uh, that's another story. The serious thing is that we need to work on these issues. Um, there, there's a little story about Market Basket embedded in here, but I think we'll pass that for now. Many of you remember that story. That, to me, was a story that resonated because workers, supervisors, managers, executives, truck drivers, and customers and the community all stood up 
when a good high road firm was being threatened by being taken over by somebody who wanted to maximize short term gains for the owners. And they prevailed largely because it resonated so well with all of us in society and largely because there was this broad based coalition that uh, supported their efforts. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to bring the voices of the American public into this process and see if we can find a way forward. So you've been very patient. I thank you very much for, for, for both listening, but I encourage you to, to join us in this call for action. Someone can ki kill the light. Great. That's good. Um, so let me uh, let me begin by uh, uh, first of all uh, saying how what an incredible uh, pleasure it is to have uh, Tom Koken here with us uh, this uh, this afternoon. Uh, Tom uh, was we have a long history. Tom was my teacher, my advisor, mentor, colleague, co-author, and certainly friend. Uh, and uh, and as you as you heard, he's a real role model. Uh, this is someone who does amazingly rigorous research, very very innovative teaching, but applies this work to real world issues. Uh, through his research and teaching and public uh, service, Tom's work always focuses on promoting justice and solidarity. And my own uh, research has been very much shaped uh, by Tom's work uh, and the way that I try to do my job. Uh, is very much inspired uh, by Tom. So it's really, really wonderful to have you here uh, uh, today uh, with us. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, sort of kind of kick off the conversation by asking a couple questions um, just to sort of get us, uh, get us going. But, you know, the, let's just sort of stand back for a second. The basic question or problem that Tom is addressing in this talk is, you know, how best can we redress issues of joblessness or poor jobs, inequality, lack of voice and participation both at work but in society uh, as a whole. And these are very, very important, if not the most important uh, questions that our society uh, faces uh, today. Uh, and Tom's uh, response to this question is we need to generate uh, and build a new social contract. Uh, and then he outlines what, what are the components of that social contract. And so what I want to do is in the spirit of agreeing both with the diagnosis and this goal of trying to build a, a new form of contract, compact, movement, et cetera, um, to ask a couple questions. And the first question has to do with uh, the kind of unit of analysis. You know, um, in, this con in this talk uh, and in the book, which I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to read, um, you know, what we have is a lot of discussion, and you heard it uh, in the talk, about individual firms, right, individual companies, Costco versus Walmart, Southwest versus Delta, uh, and things like that. And, um, but we have to ask ourselves, is really the most important unit of analysis the individual company? Should it be the industry? Should it be the value chain or supply chain in which several firms at different levels are organized? Uh, or should it be the basic community? And this is important because different units, whether we're talking about the company or the community or the nation or the industry, actually create different openings for us to intervene and, and actually require very different kinds of strategies for us uh, to uh, intervene. And I think that this is, it's not a question about Tom's work, this is a general question for all of us, which is, what are the most important or salient or influential points of leverage of opening in today's world? Um, is it through individual companies? Is it through value chains? Is it through uh, the community? And I, um, I don't have the answer to this. I worry about it being just a company-focused um, approach, given uh, what we know about the fissured workplace, given what we know about value chains, given what we know about uh, mobility of people in and out of companies. So I think we need to ask uh, that uh, question. Um, the second uh, question that I want to ask is, has to do with sort of the cross-worker-and-something-else the, the cross strategy. 
Tom began the talk uh, talking about a cross-generational uh, strategy. On the slide uh, on rebuilding worker voice, uh, there is a discussion of other kinds of, uh, of approaches. And I think that this is really important for any of us who want to promote greater solidarity, justice, fairness um, uh, in our uh, society. In this same room, Yesterday afternoon, I attended an event, and it was all about immigration and immigration reform, et cetera. And the place was absolutely packed, and the two um, sort of overflow rooms were also uh, packed. Um, this room is very well attended, but it's not packed in the same way. And I think that tells us something, that some issues are attracting pe more people uh, uh, than others. And I think that this is really important, because there's a lot of energy in our society around issues of environment. There's a lot of energy in our society around issues of identity and identity politics or status uh, and, and things like that. And so the question is, how do we link those different movements? Because I think they're all in different spheres pushing for the same thing, which is issues of solidarity and justice and fairness, uh, et cetera. But it has to be a cross-issue coalition. It can't just be a cross-generational one in the, same, uh, in the same sphere, because I think we limit ourselves uh, that way. And I think the history of the United States shows that the real reforms that have happened in this country have actually usually started from the bottom up, from communities and states up to the federal government, often not the other way around. And it's actually been promoted by cross-class or cross-group uh, coalitions. The big movement of union organi organizing in the 30s and 40s was organizing around labor, but also ethnic ethnicity, around identity and integration and things like that. So are there lessons that we can uh, learn um, uh, that way? The, the third question has to do with um, this problem of we have these best practices already uh, in, the, in our society. You know, we have the Costco's and we have the Southwest and we have the market basket. In fact, Tom, a couple of years ago, um, spoke about market, bas market basket in the same room uh, during, uh, shortly after I think the strike uh, had been, um, had been uh, settled. But I think it's important for us to, uh, so we have these, we know already, we have real world proofs of what it can be, but somehow it doesn't get diffused. And so what's going on in terms of the mechanisms of diffusion? Uh, and I think the argument that Tom basically uh, makes is uh, a competitive one. It's hard to sort of promote the uh, high road if you're in a world of a lot of low road and because of the stock market and financialization uh, and, and, and things like that. And maybe, you know, but we should actually ask ourselves, how do we actually promote this, uh, this diffusion of best practices? Should it be through self-interest, convincing company after company that, in fact, it's in their self-interest to change? Look, look what happens to Southwest and Costco and Market Basket. Uh, does it have to be a policy that they won't change unless we're forced to change? Or can there be a moral claim, a moral argument, that uh, the way to try to bring about change is never going to be simply on a self-interest, especially in a society with short-term interests, but in, in broader uh, things. And I think this is really important uh, because um, after the election, I obsessively read all these books that were trying to talk about what happened. Uh, and one of, uh, one of these uh, uh, books was uh, Strangers in Their Own Land by Arlie Hochschild, uh, which is really a fantastic book. Uh, and, uh, and it really talks about um, very different worldviews and how one understands the same facts very, very differently and the kind of empathy gaps and lack of, not only lack of information in exchange, but lack of empathy. And I, uh, and then there's the other one, the politics of uh, discontent, which is of your uh, home state. Uh, and uh, and it, I always think like it has to be more than a self-interest argument. We have to appeal to something else to try to show that there's more that connect us than differentiate us. And I don't have the answer to that, but I think it would be interesting to try to understand uh, that. And I guess the last point is the framing. Um, and Tom and I have, I think, had a, uh, I'm trying to think, it's probably a 17 or 18 year old probably discussion around this about do, is the social contract the right framing? I think that the concept behind the term that Tom uses is exactly right. Uh, but sometimes I worry that when we have a contractualist language, it sounds like exchange. Like, you do this, I, you know, it's tit for tat. You do this, I do that, this, we have a contract, uh, et cetera. And I know that that's not what Tom means. 
but I think that that's in the general uh, framing, uh, how people think. And I always think, like, should there be a different kind of framing, uh, more around solidarity, uh, or more around uh, values, or more around movement, or something like that, as opposed to a social counter? Because who's actually a party to the contract? What makes it social? What's the exchange that's going on? As opposed to, and, and, and Tom has written about this uh, in uh, the working in America. There's a whole discussion about, um, about the kinds of values that unite us and that we have to be standing for and that we heard in this presentation. So those are just four, uh, I, I think, sort of questions that come to mind when I read the book and hear the presentation. But I think it would be wonderful to hear from all of you uh, and, uh, and generate some discussion. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Rick. Why don't we open it up? Yeah. I know since in the last decade, these corporations, uh, uh, presidents and executives make an exorbitant amount of money, multi-million dollar salaries, and also some bank presidents and executives and uh, making millions of dollars, many, 20, 30, 50 million, and uh, uh, when they retire, some of them still make multi-million dollars after they retire annually, and that's not uh, a, a job anymore. So uh, as part of uh, trying to be more equitable with the population, and also like say like Bank of America, they got the retained earnings of about $25 billion, $30 billion, about these last seven, eight years, they don't pay any interest that they save, they say much, or they invest in the stock market. Like they'll give you one tenth of one percent. Can we just get to the, the yeah, question? Okay, so the question question is, is what you do about it? Yeah, I know, is, is this something that you, uh, that uh, the new administration should emphasize on trying to be more equitable with salaries so that uh, uh, they should still get millions, but not, not like 30, Thank 100 you. million dollars Tom, and stuff okay. like that. Every time. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I agree with your, your comment, and we have to push to sort of the root causes of it. The root causes are partly the decline of labor because labor disciplined businesses uh, from doing that when they were strong enough to say, if you're going to raise a CEO's salary or white collar worker's salary that much, now we're at the bargaining table and we want the same thing or something equivalent. That discipline. You also have to look at the compensation structures that the financial sector, the Wall Street pressures, the shift to a shareholder primacy model in the 1980s and beyond led to new forms of compensation that tied CEOs to the share price. And so we've got to get to those root causes. We're not going to change CEO behavior or compensation committee uh, uh, practices unless we can get to those. We can do some things on tax policy. I mean, we, we certainly could tax at a higher rate. We probably will go in the wrong direction on that, but I think that's that's got to be part of the solution as well. There's a question here? Uh, yes, so uh, one of the sort of, uh, big rises of, uh, of the, also like executive pay going wildly out of control is the sort of rise of um, intermediate uh, investors. Uh, so how, how would you say, like, we, we comment that like there's like project advisors, ETFs, all this stuff. How, how do we um, sort of combat that to, to ma make uh, management more responsible to the shareholders who can ultimately then try to make them more responsible to labor? Uh, that's, a, that's another very, very good point. And again, w I, I think we have to get Wall Street uh, to a point where their investment analysts understand what it takes to compete on a high road. They, most of them don't or they don't pay attention. We've got to provide better data so that they can be asking for that. We've got to promote uh, with our own dollars, uh, some putting dollars into these social investment funds and help them to grow over time and change how we teach the next generation of finance specialists in our, in our educational institutions. This is going to. This is this is all part of, of a change process. But fundamentally, and this comes right back to Rick's uh, key point, unless we make this a very clear moral argument about what the norms ought to be on compensation, and what is a fair compensation, and we're not we're we're not trying to take something away from someone who is legitimately entitled to a higher salary because of skills and responsibilities. But let's start to talk about those norms in a public way and recognize that when we had those norms in the past, the economy grew, people's 
uh, incomes grew. We, we grew the, stand, the, the middle class. Now we have so many, such a much more diverse workforce that we're, we need to bring all of these groups into this process. But it starts by making a moral claim around wage norms and compensation norms. We'll keep working our way through the room. Jack? Um, so there's been a lot of talk recently about artificial intelligence, yep. including by some of the MIT yep. economics department, second machine agent, things like that. So, and I, I do computer science, so the advances are coming very yeah. quickly. And what, what can be done about large-scale unemployment? Because if there, are, if there are no jobs, they can't work at a high-road company. So we good. can good. insulate yeah. the, the current labor yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's not surprising someone of your generation is raising that because it's a real concern. Uh, uh, the short answer is I'd encourage you to, to sign up for the online course because we spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> but setting that aside, I'll give you the short version. We don't know how many, what the net bal balance will be of displacement of jobs versus creation of new jobs with all this wonderful technology. Historically, we've been able to absorb by creating new jobs people do lose jobs. There is going to be displacement. But we also know that the biggest change that artificial intelligence and all of the interrelated new technologies in the digital world are going to produce is it's going to change the way we work. It's not going to just eliminate a lot of occupations. It'll eliminate some. But it's going to change how we work. It can augment work as well as as uh, view labor as, as just a factor to be replaced. We need to be part and parcel of the decisions, the choices that technology designers make and companies make when they develop the technologies and implement them so that we bring work systems and worker, worker ingenuity and worker discretion into the, to the, to the equation. We build the technologies to augment human judgment and human work. I think that is a frontier that is, is, is opening up and there's lots of evidence that we can do it in multiple ways. And so we can't, uh, you know, just like the Luddites couldn't stop the Industrial Revolution by you know, taking hammers to their uh, textile machines, we can't stop the technology, but we can influence how it is developed, how it's implemented, and how it can be used to augment work, and then we deal with the real displaced, um, uh, the, the displacement effects that, that will come forward so that people can, can move to alternative jobs. So it's a, it's, a it, it's a combination of strategies, public policy strategies, educational strategies, and organizational design strategies and technology design strategies that I think are all possibilities. And, and more technologists, even uh, you know, my good friend Eric Brynolfsson, the author of, of the book you mentioned, is coming around to thinking about this, not only thinking about it, but, 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 but really exploring how this can be done. I mean, he's much more, he's not uh, uh, of the view, if he ever was, that technology is going to take over everything, only if we let it. If we don't, we need the institutions and the choices that can, can capture the benefits of technology and extend its benefits to larger numbers. Tony, a lot of, we'll, we'll get, try to get everybody in. Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, and we can maybe take a couple yeah. of questions, too. Part, part of the business community, the high-tech community, has of late become enamored with the idea of a basic income. Yeah. As, yeah. And you can see this as a yeah. complete abnegation of any desire to deal with all the complicated things you're talking mm -hmm. about and a side payment to keep those who we displaced happy. On the one hand. On the other hand, you might say, that what's going on is a radical transformation of the notion of work and that in some sense we may have to think about redefining value as related to yeah. what is considered work and yeah. employment. So I'm interested in, in how you see the basic income as part of some social compact or is it a danger to moving in the direction you want or potentially part of a solution? Yeah. Um. I uh, respect people who are uh, making the argument for the basic uh, uh, income. Andy Stern is a friend of mine who has written a book about this, uh, former service employees union president, very articulate, bright guy. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a pipe dream, and I think it's dangerous. Work has moral value. Work has psychological We get some parts of our identity from what we do. We, we, we contribute in important ways to society. 
we can't just focus on the economic side of work. We've got to think about it in a holistic way, and I, I don't think uh, I want to see a day where we basically provide just an income uh, in lieu of work. Uh, it's not going it, to, we aren't going to get there with a high enough uh, amount of money to, uh, to do this in any event. Uh, th most of this is coming from Silicon Valley where, you know, they're worried a little bit about this and they think that we could get rid of a whole bunch of other welfare programs and just provide cash. I th I, there's some little experiments in Finland and Canada. Let's see how they work out. But I'm very much uh, a skeptic and, and opposed to thinking about it as a solution. Do we have to reconfigure work hours, scheduling, work life, and, and better balance over time and maybe reduce the number of work hours? Of course we can do all of that. That's a gradual process that we ought to start moving in that direction and do it in sensible ways so people have choices. And then when people really are hurt, the, the 55 and over or whatever the, the, the age cutoff is, where they aren't going to be able to find high, uh, the, the kind of jobs that they, they, they had, there I think some income supplements and wage insurance or those kinds of options should be explored. But it's not a substitute for work and it never will be, I, 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 I don't believe. We'll take a few questions. I want to follow up on the question you asked, Rick, about these different movements or um, you know, opportunities that are swirling around. Um, I've been very involved in things like shared value, platform cooperativism, gig economy, uh, TO organization. So there are a lot of things happening that are really experimenting with flat organization, more human centered. And I'm just wondering what you think it would take to learn better, faster from those initiatives. Um, with this idea, not the term you used, but speeding up the progression. Six two more. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that lovely talk. Uh, I share your sentiment, uh, but I may be a bit less optimistic because I think that there's probably a lock-in that, that we're currently in between the low road and the high road, which is that to do with, for example, maximizing shareholder value, uh, where so much of maximizing shareholder value is run by you know, in large institutional funds and all the rest of them, where labor itself is tied into it. Right, you're kind of endogenous to it. Yep. Your own pension yep. plans, everything is tied into it. So, so there is this lock-in that's at play. And to go back to Rick's point, uh, with the use of the term social contract, uh, I'm sympathetic to that again. <coughs> but again, it's the term contract which was exploited in the theory of the firm, that famous paper, uh, which kind of started this notion that everybody is contracted. Uh, Within a firm, everybody gets paid out except for the shareholder, which is what leads to this primacy of the shareholder, right? So I think there, perhaps that's just a comment that, that there mm -hmm. is an issue with you know using the word contract. And the second point that I wanted to make was that the the the, the story that you're saying is largely about organized uh, labor, so to speak, somewhat in these corporations. But there is a big segment which is now the gig economy and all the rest of it, all the disruptive economy which we see not only in Silicon Valley in, in the US, but we also see it in places like Germany, where it's a completely two-track system that, that's going on. So what's your view on that? Yeah. Good. Maybe Good. take one more. Yes? A lot of what you've proposed looks like it's going to take quite a while to get moving in the direction that you've suggested. Um, how long do you think the Trump voters are going to wait for their jobs? What, and what specifically, what jobs are they going to get now? Because I don't think they're going to wait for all of the, I, I, I mean, what's going to happen to them? They, his entire campaign was built on jobs and health care. We can see what's happening with health care right now. So what's going to happen when they, guess, when, he, when they don't get their jobs? Well, I, I, I can uh, offer some comments, but I would encourage uh, both. Ed and Rick to, to comment as well. You know as much about these issues as I do. Uh, let me start and, and tie the first two comments, and I will come. I'll, I'll end with with yours um, about the gig economy and organizational innovations uh, and the, the the question of what we do about them. Well, I think we have to learn about the positives and the negatives. I'm delighted with the pressure that uh, Uber is now getting uh, in the press. I think it was this morning's paper, maybe it was yesterday's, I can't recall, 
I think it was this morning that the New York Times had a you know a, another article about the mess that um, uh, it, it, it seems to be uh, playing out within the the workforce, not among the the drivers, but within the um, regular employees at, at at Uber. Well, you know, here's an organization that had lots of choices in how it designed its platform. It goes back to the technology choice. Why did it do it in a way that it controls all the information and uses contract workers? And and uh, keeps their keeps reducing their compensation over time as as the organization um, uh, evolves. Well, we've got to have uh, much more uh, inclusive entrepreneurship. We need to really think about how to build those organizations from the ground up. There's no reason why those couldn't be higher quality jobs, uh, contractor or otherwise. And as we think about movement toward that economy, toward the contractor, the fissured workforce, uh, workplace, and in the gig economy, and if the gig economy grows, we've got to extend our employment policies to cover anybody who works. Not always in the same way, because that's too simplistic, but there are a lot of people thinking about what are the appropriate or viable ways to make our benefits more portable to extend uh, 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 rights of voice and, and, and uh, organizing to gig economy and to contract workers, to people in the franchise uh, segment of our economy. Larger numbers are in those segments than in the gig economy at the moment, and they're unprotected from equal employment opportunity to uh, minimum wages to rights to organize and the, the full range. So we, we, we need to make our, bring our whole range of employment policies into the modern era. And, and I didn't talk about that today, but if, there's a lot in, in the book and a lot in what we, 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 we teach and what we're, we're studying now to figure out how to do that. And I think there are models for, for moving in that direction. Uh, I think uh, David Weil, our, clearly our, our leading expert on, on this topic, took uh, some very positive steps while he was at the Labor Department to start to extend coverage to uh, these groups. Senator Warren, our senator in, in, in Massachusetts, has spoken out on this. I think there's, a, there's um, Senator Warner uh, from Virginia, a more conservative Democrat, has been thinking a lot about these issues. So I think we can make progress, but it, it, it won't come overnight, and, and it won't uh, 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 bring about change unless, and this comes to, to, to your particular uh, point, you know, social change doesn't come in a nice, slow, linear fashion. And, and Rick alluded to it. We've laid the foundations with a lot of innovations at the local level, just as we did before the New Deal. But it took the Depression and it took workers in the streets and the fear that we were going to lose our capitalist system to something else that brought about the New Deal. And the New Deal didn't change things overnight, but it started a process to build institutions and to provide the floor that allowed the economy to grow in a more positive way. And it took a lot of investment, unfortunately, a war. We can invest in whether it's infrastructure, education, or some combination, but it's going to take, it, I, I think we are at a moment. We've got to continue to speak up. We've got to continue to work in these cross coalitions that Rick mentioned with uh, people fighting for women's rights, for immigrant rights, and for other, uh, other causes and use that as the basis for then saying, okay, now that we've got people's attention, now let's talk about what can be done. And that's our job. Our job is to listen to what people are, are, are saying and then to have, have, have alternatives. And I don't know the answer to the investment question completely. I do know that, that there's more movement in investment circles in the direction that I'm talking about. It's minuscule. We need they will move when they see the economy becoming so unstable because of all the unrest and because of people getting concerned and because of what could happen or uh, bad policies when the economy really tanks because of this emphasis on short term and the volatility perhaps we'll have another opportunity to, to shift but it's going to take a lot of work and, and, and I, I, I share the concern. Let's take one more Question, yes, and then we'll give Rick a chance and Tom to have the last word. I just had a comment about what Mr. Mock said. Uh, the other week you had the uh, talk about immigrant rights. Yesterday. And the place was yeah. packed, and then this it is a good crowd here, but not as many. Um, I've been fortunate enough to live and work in a couple of countries, 
and the one thing that I've noticed amongst all of them is basically everyone wants a decent job, raise their family. And I think a lot of the issues nowadays in the states and across the world is because there's so much uncertainty about people's jobs that the first thing they do is when they're concerned about their well-being, they clamp down on any sort of openness towards change of whether it's people or new ideas or technology. And I think all these different groups, while their causes are you know noble, they're kind of swinging at a pitch in the dirt because the real issue is sort of the social contract and what are people going to do to take care of themselves and if that's not there none of this else none nothing else really matters at least that's my opinion thanks why don't you take a chance then we'll give tom the last word yeah so let me let me just say uh maybe a couple things um and touches on this last point which is i i really think that what's important creating good jobs for a good economy uh, is uh, absolutely essential for our future, uh, for our social peace, for prosperity, et cetera. But I think that the way to promote that has to be across different issues. So we're talking right now about jobs and things like that, but we could be talking about education. What we, the big issue in this country right now is inequality. And the biggest predictor of whether or not uh, one's life chances allow you to have good jobs, less job, is the quality of your education. And so linking jobs to education, jobs in education to issues of environment and housing, there, if we can connect those issues, I think we can bring a build, uh, build a stronger uh, coalition. And I, and I think there's a lot of energy on those things. Uh, and I think that that's... Um, uh, something that I think is very, very important. And I think to the technology uh, points, yeah, some jobs are going to uh, disappear, but others will be created. Uh, and there's a lot of jobs that can be created in education, in the green uh, sector, in wellness, et cetera, and we just have to uh, do that. So that's the number one thing. And I think the second thing is, um, is to really try to think a little bit about um, what are the alternative models? And this is, Puneet had, had raised this, and Tom had mentioned that, you know, um, there are different forms of capitalism. That's one of the things that Puneet uh, works on. And, you know, are there ways within our history and culture, et cetera, that we can still maybe just sort of adapt things so that the pendulum isn't so, so we're not locked in just in one model and in others. And what we've seen is cycles. And Eric uh, Preynard, another PhD student in political science, is actually showing the incredible cycles that have existed uh, in, in uh, this country's economy that's focused on low road versus high road. It's not the first time. By the way, the 1920s uh, had a whole period where you had kind of cartels that were trying to promote high roads. It, got, it collapsed. It led to a moment of uh, actually teens and 20s into this kind of competition based on commodity. That led to a collapse. And then it got rebuilt closer to a, a high road. Can we imagine a new cycle? And what would that look like? And so I think that there is some optimism here. Well, I, I would just build on that uh, uh, kind of historical uh, journey that Rick just took us uh, through. We have done. Uh, better at different points in time. So it's not with, not, not outside of the possibilities of this society to come to terms and to think about new strategies and to put the right institutions and policies in place to make them happen. But I, I want to end by saying the only way that's going to happen is if we start to really listen to these voices, whether it's the politics of discontent in Wisconsin or Arlie Hochschild's book about uh, the, the uh, uh, people in Louisiana in the uh, chemical belt down there and the terrible pollution, or a book that uh, I think Rick knows about as well that we just, we just did a, a, a video uh, uh, session with called Exit Zero uh, by one of our anthropologists at, at uh, MIT, uh, Christine Wally, and she chronicles her family's experience in the southeast end of Chicago when a big steel plant that employed her father and whole family shut down in the 1980s and uh, the consequences for that community that uh, then ended up uh, voting uh, uh, for Donald Trump uh, in, in the last election. We need to listen to these people and if we listen to them and show respect for them then I think we will start to build the kind of cross-cutting coalitions particularly now, the opportunity to listen more than any to anyone else 
is to listen to the immigrants who are being persecuted and 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 uh, their the, the value that immigrants have brought to this society and to this economy is is being uh, ignored and it'll be ignored at our own peril it's inappropriate from a moral standpoint from a democratic standpoint but it's disastrous from an economic standpoint so let's use that as the moment of building cross-cutting coalitions, whether it's the high technology industry or it's the restaurant workers um, that, uh, and the hotel workers that, that serve us so well in our communities. That's an opportunity for, for beginning to build a, a coalition. So I, I think it's, we're at a, a, a particularly potentially pivotal historic uh, uh, point. My only hope is that we don't just react reacting uh, to whatever happens in Washington is maybe a necessary step and a mobilizing step, but we've got to offer people an alternative. And we've got to offer it in a clear narrative, not with 12 policies. And, and I, I, you know, am a victim of that sometimes. But we've got to find whether it's social contract, solidarity, or some other mechanism, some other way of communicating a very clear, and I mean simple in the best sense of that term, simple narrative that, that really reaches people because we've heard, heard their concerns. That's, I think, as important as any piece of research that we do right now. It's figuring out how to communicate and to find leaders who will, will with credibility, put their, their careers, their, their future, and, and, and maybe their life on the line for standing up for these values. I think if we do that, we'll, we'll, we'll prevail through this chaotic period and, and maybe find a way, way forward. Let me thank you all for your questions and Rick for your fantastic discussion and Tom, especially you for this moving and provocative presentation. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.